professor in the labor study. I'm an assistant professor um, in the Rutgers School of Management and Labor Relations in the Labor Studies Department. And I wanna begin by thanking my co-panelists and especially Dave for organizing this roundtable. My research on collective bargaining in higher education looks at the ways bargaining and other forms of collective, <coughs> sorry, collective bargaining in higher ed, um, our faculty governance can help reduce the precarious nature of contingent faculty work. So the ways that collective bargaining and faculty governments can um, reduce precarious nature of conduct contingent faculty. And by contingent faculty, I mean all faculty, full or part-time who work on contract with no path to tenure. And since Eric is here, I wanna thank him for um, allowing me to contribute a chapter to his edited collection with Claire Goldstein on um, the history of contingent faculty. It's under review at the University of Illinois Press right now. I'm also a member of LACHA's Contingent Faculty Committee, and this committee advocates for contingent members and also faculty across um, the academy and works to make sure that all faculty have access to professional development and research support and anything that they might need. I'd be happy to discuss some of the efforts that the Contingent Faculty Committee has done during the Q&A, and please let me know if you'd like to join the committee. Claire Goldstein is the chair right now. And today I want to talk about the work of the faculty union at Rutgers University um, <clears throat> and the coalition of uh, unions representing about 20,000 employees across the university. It's 19 unions and it formed in the early days of the pandemic and sought to work with administration to bring a people centered approach to our pandemic response. And I hope many of you were at the opening plenary uh, college for all and a national agenda for labor labor and higher education and heard from our AAUP AFT local 6323 president Todd, Todd Wilson. Yeah, I just started my third year at Rutgers and I'm a member of the, or I guess I'm finishing my third year at Rutgers and I'm a member of um, the faculty union in New Brunswick. And I arrived during the negotiations and what turned out to be a very historic collective bargaining agreement that promised to bring racial and gender e equity and pay to all three campuses. And I want to talk briefly about the terms of the current agreement, but I want to spend some time looking at the um, pandemic response. So members ratified the current contract in April 2019, and it covers the period from July 2018 to 2022. And a key highlight is the faculty equity program, which provides a mechanism for people across the three campuses to get pay equity. It addresses race, gender, and campus pay differentials. And since July 2019, about 130 people have applied to participate, yet the administration has, offered a, has not offered a ruling on any of the cases. In response to that, five Rutgers employees filed a lawsuit based on the 2018 New Jersey Equal Pay Act. And so we'll see how that unfolds. Another feature of the co current contract is the expanded job security for full-time non-tenure track faculty. Um, so for example, uh, non-tenure track faculty member cannot be reappointed for a period shorter than their previous term. And after six years, we'll receive a minimum three-year contract appoint upon each reappointment. Also, um, they can be reappointed for any seven-year term. At any point, they can be reappointed, sorry, for a seven-year term. And for the first time ever, non-tenure track faculty, full-time faculty have a grievance procedure that empowers them to challenge non-reappointments and decisions not to promote. And together with raises for graduate student employees, the equity raises and academic freedom, including social media, the Rutgers AAUP AFT has a powerful faculty union agreement. So we still have a lot of work to do. Now, part-time lecturers or adjuncts are in a different bargaining unit here at Rutgers. And if there's time during the open discussion, I'd like to have a larger conversation about bargaining union makeup and adjunct protections. While the Rutgers PTL contract doesn't represent the across the board raises we were looking for, it does offer a significant pay raise and a path to career advancement. There are three levels of um, adjunct faculty and after 12 semesters, um, part-time lecturers are <clears throat> given the or yeah, given the opportunity to be promoted um, to the next level um, with a 9% pay raise. And so the pay, raise are, pay raises are staggered um, across the agreement. 
uh, one thing that's missing from the current agreement is uh, health insurance benefits. And this really played out during um, the early days of the pandemic, especially when so many of the part-time lecturers were laid off. Um, the postdocs, our bargaining unit are still under still negotiating with the administration. The administration has canceled many of their agreed upon sessions. And when they did show up, showed up unprepared. And so I'd also like to talk to talk later about um, the things that we're doing, the coalition of unions, what we're doing to help support the postdocs um, if we have time at the end of the session. So when the pandemic spread uh, to the United States in March, 2020, Rutgers unions got together to form this coalition. And it's been hard to really push the administration to accept us as a coalition and bargain with us. What the administration tried to do was to continue to work with each individual union. And, you know, I'm really proud of the fact that um, Todd Wolfson as president of our union really just struck, stuck to, you know, stuck to his guns and said, we're not going to negotiate independently. We're going to do this together. You know, we got together at first when they fired all, Rutgers fired all of the dining hall workers on campus when they shut down campus in March. And you know, we immediately started holding rallies and, you know, car caravans. We had education sessions on Zoom so that dining hall workers could speak to faculty union members and talk about their experiences. We had um, undergraduate students talking about their experiences and what would happen if um, their parents who are dining hall workers uh, lost their jobs and they lost their tuition remission. And the pressure that the public pressure that the coalition put forward got most of those dining hall workers and some of the other faculty or staff members, I should say, um, at the Newark campus, their jobs back. And, you know, some of the initial demands that we put together outside of protecting jobs was um, personal um, protection equipment, uh, the reversal of the layoffs, and to settle all the existing open union contracts. And that's, you know, been the one thing that we're still struggling with, especially with the postdocs. Um, and then expanding healthcare for Rutgers workers. And that's something that has um, come through finally. And we actually opened up open enrollment again in early May. And it's been um, very exciting, especially for me, because, you know, it looks like a $2,000 saving on um, health insurance over the rest of the year because, you know, it goes into effect into July. And so that was a hard fought battle and really thankful that the coalition was able to get that sorted for us. And, um, you know, the work share program to for fur furloughs for faculty, um, you know, we've been asking for that since last March. It was finally negotiated and then voted on and approved in April. And this has um, really helped um, because it, in that agreement, it said that there's no longer a fiscal emergency at Rutgers. And so the administration had to admit that, you know, there was no fiscal emergency, rescind the layoffs, um, get people a path to re rehiring for a lot of the part-time lecturers. And, you know, it's just gonna be up to the faculty to really make sure that part-time lecturers are back at the numbers that they were pre-pandemic. And that's one of the things that, you know, I'll talk about again if we have time later. Um, so since the pandemic started, the faculty union came to an agreement um, for, those on the path to tenure to exclude a year from their probationary period and then a second year. And so people on the path to tenure, you know, assistants and associate professors can, you know, apply for, and it, applying is really just saying to your chair, you know, in writing that you want to take a, a year, have a year excluded um, from your probationary period or your um, reappointment period. And I think that that's something that was useful, but it's also kind of a two-edged two sword because a lot of people are worried about doing it and how it will look if people will really say, okay, that year is excluded or will it count against them? And so the union has been working hard to make sure that there's language um, for chairs to encourage um, senior faculty to vote um, without any prejudice in this, and then also to include instructions in getting outside letters for faculty members. But I will stop here and um, pass it along, and thank you. I, I don't know who's next, so Naomi, why don't you choose one of us? 
Dave, you're next in the program, so. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so uh, uh, good morning to those of you who are in Central Mountain and uh, Pacific time, and uh, good afternoon to the East Coast folks. Uh, my name is David Hamilton Golland, and I'm a professor of history at Governor's State University outside of Chicago, uh, where I am also the coordinator of the humanities programs and the uh, president, uh, for another couple of months at least, of the University Faculty Senate. And uh, although my scholarship is in labor and African American history, uh, what I'm talking about today is um, a sequence of events that took place over the winter of 2019 to 2020. That is, we didn't know it at the time, but on the eve of the pandemic. And um, it, uh, of course, I was presiding over the Senate at, at that time, as I still am. And what happened was our university president became the subject of an inquiry by the state inspector general's office there had been allegations of um, uh, uh, fiscal uh, malfeasance or misfeasance. And I think one is sort of considered to be on purpose and the other seems to be sort of by accident. For those of you who haven't heard the word misfeasance, as I had never heard before any of this happened, I had certainly heard of malfeasance. Um, and our, our president had always been a bit of a controversial figure on campus as so many university presidents are among the faculty, um, but uh, had a number of accomplishments that we had assisted her in over the decade or so that she had presided over the university, including our expansion. We had been a sophomore and up, uh, sorry, a junior and up institution, an upper division and, and master's students only institution. And in 2014, we expanded to include freshmen and sophomores for the first time, built a gen ed program. And uh, we just recently started our first PhD program over in our, in our health college. So we've kind of expanded in both directions. Uh, and those, those were in, initiated by this president. And um, so a lot of the faculty had mixed emotions about uh, this president's record. And some uh, had downright hostility. And for some, it was even personal. And um, the, when the inspector general's report came out on, I believe it was December 20th, 2019, uh, as I read the pages, I realized I was not going to get a holiday break um, in my capacity as faculty senate president uh, that year, because uh, it was ultimately the president was being accused of, um, of, uh, of fostering uh, uh, false timesheets being filled out by staff uh, for a month after month after month after they had been terminated. The staff knew they had been terminated. The administration and their supervisors knew they had been terminated, but the president kept signing their timesheets and getting them paid. And um, if you go towards the malfeasance side, you sort of wonder, did these people know where certain bodies were buried uh, that the president was covering up? Um, but there was no, uh, the, the inspector general found no positive evidence of that sort of kind of nefarious, you know, behind the scenes, hands rubbing together kind of activity. Uh, but ultimately the buck does stop with the president of the university and it was her signature on these forms. So they came down on the misfeasance uh, side. Uh, she didn't do her job well enough. And um, uh, as a, as a result, at the end of the report, it said that the allegations were quote unquote founded. And now as faculty senate president, I kind of felt like, oh gosh, I guess we need to do something about this. And uh, we waited a couple of days to see if the board of trustees would do anything or to see if the president would just simply resign. Um, and you know, these things, because uh, these things often do happen. And uh, uh, the president did not resign, and ultimately the Board of Trustees published a brief memo to the campus community uh, saying that we all care about the campus. You know, it was one of those kind of anodyne, uh, nothing sort of letters like, we read it too, we know what's up, but we're not going to do anything about it. Um, and so uh, we, on the Faculty Senate leadership team, we decided that we've got to start the ball rolling. We had a a January meeting scheduled for the third Thursday of January, as we always do. And we had already 
created an agenda which had nothing to do with any of this. It was this, the usual agenda, the approval of policy proposals and resolutions on other stuff and that sort of thing. And, uh, reports from various other committees. And uh, we decided to create an alternate agenda that would allow for uh, one faculty member to sort of lay out what the inspector general's report uh, found and to invite the president or her designee to come and, you know, defend herself and, you know, kind of in a sort of a mock court type of thing. But we, we felt like we needed to be fair to her and give her the opportunity um, to, well, gosh, I mean, just come and show up and apologize, you know, just take responsibility. If you, you and the board clearly want us to move on, there needs to be something from you. And, uh, uh, so we, we created this sort of alternate agenda and then we, we got the executive committee of the Senate to approve it. And so we went forward with two existing agendas because also we, we thought perhaps the president simply won't come back after the holiday break. And, um, and yet the president did come back uh, after the holiday break and began going to the college meetings that typically take place in the, in the week before classes, almost as if nothing untoward had happened. Um, and so uh, I talked to every single member of the Senate and you know I explained what we were doing as the leaders of the Senate and how we felt that this was the responsible path to take but that ultimately every senator would have to vote her or his conscience on the matter. And um, it was a, it was ultimately the agenda was called the a confidence agenda. I mean, this was a discussion of and a vote of confidence. And I learned over the course of this that you stated in the positive, you are considering confidence, you are not considering no confidence. But of course, this only happens when we're thinking about voting no confidence. Uh, because the confidence in our administration is typically assumed unless we go forward with such a vote as this. And so um, the day came and uh, some of the senators had read the inspector general's report and others had just read perhaps some of the news reports in the Chicago Tribune about it. And our parliamentarian who is who happens to be a lawyer presented the case for no confidence and explain what the inspector general had found and why this is not behavior that we should accept from a university president, uh, or at least why the university president needed to be held responsible for it. And then it came time for the president or her designee to speak and she didn't show up, nor did she send a designee. And so what we did then is we went into closed session so that our untenured senators could feel free to say whatever they needed to say without fear that someone else out in the room uh, who had been observing the meeting, and by the way, this was the best attended meeting I've ever seen. I don't just mean that all the senators showed up, which are there are about 27 or 28 of us or were at the time. Um, I mean, like the, the hall was packed and we, we never see that, uh, you know. Um, and it was packed with, with faculty, but also with students and, staff and some, very few, but some administrators came as well. We had one dean and one chair who did show up. Uh, and I think also the dean of students showed up as a matter of fact, but just packed hall. So we cleared the hall, we had our closed session, everyone was able to speak their minds. And, um, and then we came back into open session and we had a uh, paper ballot uh, where, you know, it was check here for confidence, check here for no confidence. And, um, uh, and I announced that um, if, it was, uh, if it was two thirds or more for no confidence, we would have a, we had a resolution ready to go to the board saying that we expect the, the board to act if the president will not resign, we ex expect them to terminate her. And if it was two thirds in confidence, then we were going to prepare a resolution saying the faculty has full confidence. But if it was somewhere in the middle, if it was just like a slight majority of no confidence, we had kind of a middling kind of uh, vanilla uh, version of the resolution that said, you know, we, we censure the president, but um, that, was a, that was all that we would have been doing in that case. And the vote was, actually there were 26 of us voting in the room that day, and the vote was 25 to one. 
uh, for no confidence, I should say, <laughs> in case you're at the edge of your seat wondering what, you know, what's going to happen. Uh, although I don't think I'd be doing any uh, panel presentations on this topic if it had gone the other way. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it was, I have to say, overall, it was one of the most traumatic experiences for me as a leader of faculty. I did not want this to happen. And then afterwards, I, I prepared the, I got the Secretary of the Senate to sign the resolution. We, I, I delivered it to the Board of Trustees. And then the Board of Trustees sat on it and did nothing. And um, we later came to the conclusion, I should say, I, I guess I buried the lead a little bit here. The President had already announced that she was retiring at the end of last year, effective June 30th, 2020 which is, I should say, it's why I, I also felt a little bit safe because you don't, I mean, this is, the no confidence thing is kind of a nuclear option in shared governance because it seems like it's a lose-lose for everyone. Um, and when you have a no confidence vote, as, we, as we've been doing a lot more in the last decade and a half in American academia, and as it's been increasingly ignored by boards of trustees, uh, and by the folks that we declare our lack of confidence in, it exposes our weakness. And that's a fundamental difference, I think, between when you're operating uh, as a Senate versus when you're operating as a union. Uh, you know, the, the union has a list of things that they can do um, when they have a disagreement with the administration. The Senate has the power of moral suasion and not much else. And so when you do this, you, you know, a lot, of, a lot of our authority as a Senate is based on this illusion that we have authority on campus. And when you do it, you, you risk exposing that that is not the case. Um, and so we took that risk knowing that one way or another, the president would be gone by the following year. So long-term memory would, uh, would not necessarily be quite as, um, uh, we wouldn't be quite as exposed as the weak body that we ultimately are as a Senate. Um, but yeah, like I said, very, you know, sort of traumatic for me as a leader, didn't want to do it, didn't want to go through it. Um, and then, you know, it was interesting that most of the friends that I thought were my friends who happened to be in administrative positions uh, over the years had moved into administration. Most of them decided that I was some kind of I was the guy behind the scenes rubbing my hands together like um, like I had done something wrong. Um, and uh, and that was hurtful. Uh, and I would say these things to some of my friends who are still with me on the faculty and they would go, well, did you sign any you know illegal timesheets? I mean, did you cost, I should say it was one and a half million dollars, uh, nearly $1.6 million that she paid out, not she, that the university paid out in these false timesheets. Um, and so, you know, that's been cheering to me, but on the other hand, there's that, uh, that whole other side, which, you know, it just seems to have gotten worse and worse over this past year to the point where I'm really glad I'm term limited and I'm not running for re-election as Senate president. And, you know, I've been talking in the past few months about how I get to go back to be a country doctor next year and just teach classes and write books. And, um, and I am looking forward to that. Um, but I'm, you know, in the end, I'm glad I had that experience because I, I learned a lot about how shared governance sort of really works. And I'm sure I'm well beyond time, so I'll pass it on to who is next in the program it is uh, John. John, you're up. So I'm John Beckin. I'm professor of communication at Albright College, which is a four-year liberal arts college with a small master's of education program. These are issues I've been engaged with for longer than I care to think, actually. Um, when I entered the University of Michigan as a master's student, I joined the Graduate Employees Organi Organization, an AFT local representing graduate employees, and quickly became editor of its newsletter and organizing co-chair. And so off and on, I've been working around these issues ever since. There at the University of Illinois, where I helped organize graduate teachers again. Um, and, for about five years from 1998 to 2003, working with the Coalition of Contingent Academic Labor in Boston to improve conditions for adjunct faculty in the greater Boston area, a campaign that took many forms. So we worked to organize unions, successfully organize unions at two colleges. We worked at unionized colleges to empower adjuncts to demand 
greater rights. Um, we got it three campuses health benefits for adjuncts who had not had them previously, um, despite being union represented. Um, a variety of efforts, many places it was enough to show up and hold a meeting for uh, adjuncts to get a 20% pay hike because when you're paying people while well, adjuncts get paid, it's not too expensive to try to buy them off, yes? Um, so now I'm teaching at Albright College, had been since 2003, which is why I left the Cocal campaign. Uh, Albright is in Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, I would describe it as a Philadelphia suburb, but that was never true and is not true now. It's just that I live in Philadelphia. Um, and it's in the fourth year of what administrators define or describe as a economic turnaround. So what I'm briefly going to talk about is how faculty have worked through the governance guide and the faculty handbook to try to mitigate, I wouldn't say we've resolved them, to mitigate inequities for our adjunct and non-tenure track faculty. I should note that our adjuncts offer today less than 20% of sections in our day program. And next year they will presumably offer a great deal fewer because the administration in February announced that we're replacing all adjuncts in the English department who teach composition courses with full-time faculty. I don't believe that will actually happen. I'm serving on the search committee and I believe that at the end of the day, we are not going to succeed in this very abbreviated time frame in filling the 11 tenure track and non tenure track positions that we've been given to fill, because that is really a very big ask. Yes. But many adjuncts will lose those positions um, in the fall um, because we will hire many people, um, somewhere between, I would say, five and eight, not the 11 that are budgeted. Um, We'll just, we shall see. Um, so our adjunct proportion will go down as a result of that and did go down slightly during the pandemic. Um, we did not have any pandemic related course cancellations, but enrollments did suffer significantly. And so for the spring, fewer classes were scheduled than would normally have been scheduled, which will have had an impact on adjunct I don't think any adjunct got no courses for the spring who would have normally have gotten courses, but certainly adjuncts will have gotten fewer courses for the spring than they normally would have gotten. In any event, adjuncts are less than 20% of our sections in the day program, much higher proportion in our evening program that serves non-traditional students. And TT faculty currently are about a fifth of our full-time faculty, but will increase significantly with this current initiative divided between our evening programs and with a handful of exceptions, our language and more professionally oriented programs. Several of the NTT faculty hold terminal degrees, but were either hired into the evening program, which has no tenure track faculty of its own, or were hired for positions originally conceived of as temporary, got rolled over into permanent positions, but not afforded the opportunity to become tenure track. So faculty have long worked through our shared governance structures to try to improve the economic and working conditions for our colleagues who are not on the tenure track. We do not have a union, we're a private institution. When I interviewed, the Dean informed me that unions were illegal at Albright College. Um, and so we worked, I mean, obviously he's wrong, but nonetheless, that's the position of the administration and the faculty have not taken the necessary steps to challenge that perception, yes? Um, so adjunct faculty, who have taught 18 courses over the course of their time at Albright and all NTT faculty have full voting rights in meetings of the college faculty. And we meet as a whole. Uh, we have an executive committee that um, meets in between meetings of the faculty, but we have monthly meetings of the faculty as a whole. They also have the right to vote for faculty officers, the adjuncts do, as well as the NTT faculty and in departments. NTT faculty and adjuncts, but given their situation, few do are eligible to hold faculty office. Currently two of our elected council chairs are NTT faculty out of five. Adjunct faculty are with voting rights are eligible for conference and research travel and other support as well. Their annual funding is capped at $1,000 compared to 2950 for full-time faculty, but at the same percentages of coverage. So if they're going to a conference, they get 100 to present, they get 100% funding up to the $1,000. So if it's regional, they might actually be able to cover the cost. 
Um, this has been in place for many years and many adjuncts do receive funding. NTT and tenure track faculty have the exact same eligibility for research support except for eligibility for sabbatical leaves, a restriction that we did debate two years ago, but ultimately left in place. I argued for lifting it. Uh, it was argued that few of the NTT faculty would actually be able to produce sabbatical worthy projects. I argued that that was a problem that would take care of itself, but I did not prevail. Um, the issue that actually raised it was NTT faculty applying for sabbatical, we pointed it out. That project would not have been approved. It did not meet the criteria. But that doesn't speak to the moral or ethical issue, right? Um, so these measures were, are part of our governance guide, which is under the sole jurisdiction of faculty and through implementation decisions made by elected faculty committees. Um, there's the same expectations of service for NTT and tenure track faculty. They serve on all committees except rank and tenure, where an NTT faculty member is brought in for consideration of promotion for NTT faculty. Um, while a proposal to allow conversion to tenure track lines for faculty with terminal degrees was rejected three years ago, they are eligible for continuing appointments. We're currently in the second iteration of a policy that provides for continuing appointments for full-time NTT faculty with at least six years service, whereby upon promotion, they receive three-year contracts, which automatically renew, and so are always in the first year of three, absent unsatisfactory review or program termination. Um, I'm going to skip some of the process through that because I'm taking longer than I intended to take. Um, just to note that we did extensively revise this process two years ago after the first iteration bumped up against the shoals. It was reliant upon administrative uh, cooperation and the original provost was cooperative. A new provost came in who allowed people to apply for promotion but refused even to look at their files. And so we were forced to create new processes and to take them to the board of trustees. Fortunately, that provost, I don't want this to sound the wrong, wrong way. She's no longer with us, but it's not that she has left the planet. She has just gone elsewhere to inflict her um, conduct upon other unfortunates, um, not our, us anymore. Um, so the promotion process is part of the faculty handbook. It does have the buy-in of the board of trustees now. Um, and so it is, I would say, safe from, relatively safe, as safe as any tenure process is from administrative interference. Um, now, we have not sort of succeeded in re really addressing the condition of adjuncts um, beyond the voting rights and eligibility for research funds. Um, the administration reserves the rights to cancel their classes up to a week before class. They don't do that very often. They generally give them more warning than that, but it has happened. Um, their pay is very low, has always been very low. Um, proposals to try to increase it have not gone uh, anywhere. The administration insists that it's comparable to pay at other area institutions, which may well be true um, because, you know, we all know that adjuncts are never well paid, right? Um, except when they organize the demand otherwise. I'll briefly mention COVID um, because we've been talking about that and that is very much on our, you know, in our consciousness at this moment. Uh, and I think COVID at our institution at least has showed many of the shortcomings of these sort of shared governance practices. So things where we have explicit authority in the faculty handbook are relatively easy to intervene around. Things where our governance rights are more constrained or even where they're explicit but shared. So for example, academic calendars. The administration decided unilaterally to change our academic calendar for the current year to move not only the start and end dates but to switch from 15 week semester to two compressed seven and a half week terms which had major impact on curriculum, major impact upon how we teach our courses on workload and was done not only without consultation, uh, it was simply imposed and yet it's written in our governance doc documents that faculty have the right to approve the academic calendar. Uh, and then for next year, it's going back to the traditional semesters but it did not go to a faculty vote even though we voted by a 95% margin that it had to. 
Um, and when we asked at the faculty meeting following the announcement of the new schedule, why it hadn't come to a vote, they said they were concerned we might have voted against the schedule, which of course, you know, perhaps would have happened. That's what happens in a democratic process, yes? So there are some real shortcomings in how these sorts of things um, play out. And these have real impact for our students. Um, so we're in a situation where we have a pandemic task force. There are faculty representatives on it, but they were appointed by the administration and they have repeatedly threatened to resign um, because they're not even consulted. They're not even informed before decisions are taken. They learn about them in campus-wide emails. And ultimately the solution has to be to build power, to build representative institutions among the faculty that um, act in concert to change conditions. But I will stop there and turn it over to Nelson. Thank you, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers and uh, my colleagues uh, as well who agreed to participate. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, it's uh, our second round of uh, uh, activity uh, around this, this topic. And especially, uh, I'd like to thank David uh, put the, the group together initially and also steered us in the right direction since. Um, for the next 10 minutes or so, I'd like to talk about um, or give some thoughts on the costs of representation. Last time I, I talked at a conference in New York, I was talking about mobbing, and I'd like today to uh, tackle another issue um, which presents my uh, perspective from a, a different viewpoint, meaning that I'm not presenting the uh, confrontation or conflicts between employer and employee in a university setting, but uh, uh, basically what uh, a union can do to better itself and improve itself in the way it manages its affairs on a daily basis. Um, so the, my thoughts on the cost of representation uh, focus on that, the way our union can improve or maybe with the input of colleagues, we can better ourselves because as you'll see uh, soon, uh, we had, uh, num and we still have a number of issues that we need to, uh, to, uh, uh, to settle, uh, to get better because we're uh, really a, a young association. So my talk is informed by a quarter century experience uh, with the faculty association at the, the University of Moncton. Uh, whether as a member of the administrative, administrative council or senior grievance officer, um, I served two, uh, two terms in that, uh, in that title and uh, representing two bargaining units. Uh, the first one on behalf of uh, about 300 faculty and the other uh, significant even more for a growing uh, legion of adjuncts. So our faculty association was formed was founded in 1976. Uh, the university itself was created in late, uh, early 1960s, in 1963 actually, but our association exists, uh, existed by uh, recognition by the province in 1976. At the midpoint of uh, its history, uh, and thanks to the support of the uh, overwhelming majority of, of members, our association went on strike. Uh, uh, in, so for five memorable weeks, and I still have my <coughs> uh, picket cards at home in, in the garage, I'm still proud to carry them whenever we have it, events, etc. Uh, so for five weeks, we, uh, in 2000, we picketed, marched, debated, bargained with the employer for e equity as the wage gap with our Anglophone colleagues in the province had then widened to uh, about 20%. Uh, hopefully we succeeded then. Uh, so that's, that was a great success for us, even though we're still trying to catch up uh, with the, the, the wage gap uh, every time we bargain with the employer. Because as you know, the, the success, all successes are short-lived without uh, vigilance and without broad commitment from, uh, from members. So and that's why after the strike in 2000, we immediately uh, took, the challenge, took on the challenge of helping adjuncts uh, form their own association or whether to uh, form their own or join ours. So four years later, what happened is the provincial 
uh, Industrial Relations Commission recognized the right of adjuncts to join forces with us, um, uh, but as a separate bargaining unit. So our then our mission was enlarged uh, as long as, uh, as well as our challenges. And since then, in, in the last two decades or, or so, um, our efforts to promote, to defend our interests uh, uh, of about 750 members has confronted us with uh, a, a number of new and significant challenges. And among them, uh, my topic today is the cost of representation, legal in particular, legal representation. And uh, whether these costs are created or uh, originate from the, uh, the, the case of uh, faculty grieved during tenure or promotion process, whatever the case is, this is a, a really a big issue for, for our association and pers personally in the last uh, 10 years at least. And what is happening now in the US with the case of Nicole uh, Anna Jones, uh, that is now stirring the US academic community and American society in general, uh, whether it's within or beyond the social media universe, is only a reminder of the conflicting nature of the, the peer review process in academia, but also, and I would say mostly, how the, the, the chilling influence of politics and culture can uh, quickly put to shame the, a sense of justice we are all supposed to uphold. And as you'll find out really briefly, it's not something that uh, is uh, uh, guaranteed when you join a union. So um, um, easier said than done, uh, these types of uh, uh, thoughts. But the duty of representation, uh, as you know, is a core component of the, uh, any union's mission. Uh, it is uh, our uh, a privilege. Many union workers don't enjoy at our all fully. And I make this comment comparing the association, associations that are in existence on, on campus, what are for the technician, what are for the uh, uh, employees uh, on campus, etc. Some of the associations, the technicians, for example, have uh, no or uh, almost no expenditures for legal representation. They have um, a small budget and they don't spend a lot on that. So you have few grievance cases and few confrontation that go in arbitrage or whatever, but our situation is quite different. The duty of representation um, in different union may be constrained by many factors, uh, whatever it's prohibitive, uh, uh, legal fees, limited financial resources like the technician I was talking about, or even members not geared to push for justice when faced with isolated grievances. So many situations where you have a, a different reality uh, depending on the union you, you participate or you belong to. Um, so Aldo, I could, I could talk about all three uh, sets of uh, factors. My focus will needs to be on, fa on a faculty or association that is strangely overly concerned, not overly concerned about the cost of representation. And this is a, a situation that I found strange, and I will uh, talk more about that and probably exchange with you guys after my talk is over. Uh, but first, let me present you some data from uh, between 2013 and 2020. Our association spent close to half million dollars annually. So this is our uh, annual expenditures. But although our expenditures have been trending upward uh, in the last decade, about 10% from the beginning of the decade, um, only uh, controversial sa cost-saving measures like leaving uh, our provincial faculty association, which from my perspective is a catastrophe, uh, saved us from a more serious financial burden. Uh, among all our expenditure items, two stand out when you look at the financial statements, uh, yearly financial statements. Uh, the one is the uh, relief credits covering the annual expenses of maintain, maintaining in the executive committee and the cost of legal representation. Between 2013 and 2020, we spent on average about $150,000 annually on relief credits and more than $80,000 on legal representation. Again, $80,000 when compared to other union on, on campus, none is spent on, 
on that front. So the, the figures may seem trivial to colleagues working within, within large uh, US institutions or even in Canada. But for an academic community of less than 700 individuals serving less than 5,000 students, the sum is, uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, quite significant. If the, the trend of our legal representation cost over the last decade may appear to, uh, to some like me as alarming, uh, it's only logical to dig uh, deeper and examine the connection between both expenditure items briefly presented. Uh, our legal costs represented 8% uh, of our total expenditures in 2013, 8%, a figure that rose constantly during the decade and reached a high of 23%, almost 24 in 2019. Uh, only an ad hoc decision by the Administrative Council brought our own administrative council, brought the percentage down to 11% the next year. But by recently uh, annulling the cost saving measure of the administrative council, members of our association have unfortunately put our legal cost back on its uh, ascending trajectory. Uh, then uh, the question I have is should any association spend uh, one out of every four dollars on legal services? I don't believe so. Personally, from the experience I have uh, uh, on the, in the university, I don't believe so. But uh, is it possible to get this expenditure item under control? And if so, how? Uh, first, I, and I'm not, uh, uh, I don't have the answers. I don't have all the solutions. Uh, for you today, obviously, but any serious analysis from my perspective needs to start with the people we elect to form our executive council. Uh, to, to be blunt, we have not always, and I'm talking about ours uh, at the University of Moncton, we have not always elected the most financially savvy individuals to manage of our affairs or uh, more important individuals with the strongest sense of justice and dedication. And I'm sad to say that, but that's a fact. As little interest is shown for these positions at every election cycle. I'm not sure what is your experience, but every year when we elect new members of our executive committee, we sometimes need to uh, fight with people to uh, put their name down to uh, participate and become president, vice president, secretary, et cetera. So uh, it's what I call representation by default. So we all know how the focus on research can be blinding and to the detriment that we quickly learn of our most vulnerable uh, colleagues and eventually to our uh, indifferent selves. But this obsession to operate under the motto of a uh, publish or perish can only go so far. Uh, what this means is that, again, by, by leaving the management of affairs in the hands of individuals with limited abilities, devotion, or dare I say integrity, we cancel the successes recorded over the years through hard fought negotiations, uh, strikes and court battles. Uh, going back briefly to the cost of representation, our association spends on average $150,000 or 30% to form a group of five or six individuals whose duty it is to represent, promote and defend its members to the best of it, their ability. But should that investment be enough to cover the work we need to do? In an ideal world, yes, but it is not, at least where I work. We just need to, uh, need to spend more, in particular on legal services. And that's why the $80,000 per year comes up uh, after our initial $150,000. So um, for only the legal services that we uh, spend every year, uh, in 2016, 2018, in 2019, we spent more than $100,000. And this is astronomical, again, uh, from my point of view. But again, should this be tolerated? And from my perspective, no. And we're talking about here, we're not talking about uneducated individuals, but mostly PhDs taking time to work in solidarity. Uh, and should this background help reduce the cost of our legal services? Hopefully, I think th it should, but reality reveals another uh, uh, picture on that. What is worse is that no one seems to care. 
uh, or be worried about the situation at the University of Moncton. The rising cost of legal representation is, uh, again, a disaster we need to uh, 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 tackle on uh, as soon as possible. So as the employer at the University of Moncton has not become more belligerent or confrontational with time, we have to look elsewhere for answers. Uh, the fact that we face unique challenges originating from, uh, originating from grieve colleagues over the last decade does not explain or justify the excessive nature of our recent representative, uh, representation costs. Uh, members of the executive committee that will pick up the phone to call our lawyer at the first opportunity, uh, write him uh, an email with sometimes a trivial questions are a disservice to the members and their broad interests. Uh, and without clear procedures elaborated from past experiences to guide us, it will be difficult to prevent the habits uh, overwhelming our affairs and perturbing our annual expenditures. Without confidence in a common sense approach to guide the duty of representation, we will continue to call on others charging more for practical, practical than legal advice. I could go on and on, but uh, I think it's time to conclude that uh, during the four years that uh, I served as a senior grievance officer, and I was along with uh, all the, the, the cases for over four years, um, reporting uh, weekly on the progress of cases with no cases pushed to arbitrage and economy in itself, um, because of our repeated efforts to go back to the employer with multiple offers until settlement, dedication and sacrifice were the main costs of representation and reason our key commodity. Um, however, uh, closer contacts with the routine of our executive made me realize how naive this way of thinking was and how damaging to our mutual interests silence before injustice can be. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Nelson. And thanks, everyone. Um, so it is the Q and A portion. There are but there are only nine of us in the room, so it seems like more of an informal. Uh, if you have something to ask or to or to comment, I mean, because we're not exactly sages on the stage here. Just uh, we we can learn at least as much from the other people in this room as they can from us. So just go ahead, uh, yeah, uh, go ahead and unmute them. Sure, um, uh, you are indeed sages, but um, uh, thanks for these excellent presentations. Uh, and and um, thanks for putting together a session that really gives us a focus on some very important issues. Uh, I'd like to, uh, Naomi, um, and this I think involves everybody, but Naomi, you mentioned um, being willing to talk a little bit more about the part-timers and some of the challenges particularly. And I think this, you know, whether we call them adjuncts or part-timers, um, you know, the people sort of at the bottom of this, this scale in many ways. And, and one of the challenges is, you know, particularly in the year of the pandemic, how do we keep track of, of who's there and who we're losing? You know, the many colleges and universities that claimed there were no layoffs, and yet we know of people who were not renewed. You know, those aren't layoffs, those aren't necessarily furloughs. So part of the question is um, just simply, how do, we, how do we best kind of keep track of that group of people? And, um, and what kind of work do we need to do in, um, what are some of the effective ways of organizing, um, uh, particularly the part-timers and, and adjuncts? Um, thanks, Eric. It's, you know, it's a, it's a complicated issue and it is very challenging, but you know, there are answers. I think um, it's our responsibility, those of us who are full-time faculty members, to ask questions and to demand answers from our chairs and our deans about what's happening. You know, um, when we have our, every time we have a budget meeting <laughs> at our school, my, you know, I, my hand goes up and I ask, okay, what about reappointments for part-time lecturers? I use that term because that's the official job title um, at Rutgers. Um, and so just to be clear, you know, the adjunct faculty, um, 
and part-time lecturers for me is, is, is the same thing. But um, so, you know, I asked and of course the Dean couldn't answer. And so, so then I asked the program directors, I was like, well, wait, wait, so can the undergraduate director, you know, kind of step in for each, each department? Cause we are labor studies and also human resource, resource management. And, you know, just, just to say, okay, well, well, who didn't get reappointed? How many didn't get reappointed? Um, and, you know, part-time faculty are, are welcome at our faculty meetings and encouraged to come and participate when they can. Unfortunately, <laughs> right, one of, the one of the ways that we organize our meetings is that, you know, part-time faculty are the ones who are teaching during our faculty meetings. So it makes it really hard for, for them to be present. Um, but I think that one thing that full-time faculty can do is to find out who's in their departments, who, who, are, who are working as adjuncts, and are they showing up? And you know, really pushing. You know, one of the things that I'm working on as part of our um, inclusion uh, committee, you know, our diversity, equity, and inclusion committee, is to um, send out formal letters of welcome to adjuncts every semester and thank you notes at the end of every semester. And then that way, you know, we we at least know who's who's around. There's an inform, you know, we're, we have an informal network for those who teach the general ed. Um, requirements in our department. So we know, because you know, I'm a, I'm a part of that group. And you know, most of the people who are in that group are, are adjuncts. But you know, we know who's not showing up. We know who isn't getting included amongst us. So just to, to put that out, hey, you know, what happened to so and so? Is is that person going to come back in the fall or in the spring? You know, what happened to that class? Just just asking those questions and, and continually pushing um, you know, chairs and deans to be responsive and to, to let that, you know, let that information be out there, but I'll stop and let other people jump in. I think in smaller colleges, it's somewhat easier to see who's there, who isn't there just by looking at the schedule. So for our day program, I have a pretty clear idea who's coming back, who's not coming back and can ask questions and try and figure out, was it their decision? Because sometimes it was, was it something else? Our evening program, frankly, has been undergoing a bloodbath. Um, it moved from being a profit center for the college to losing significant hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so it's being reorganized. And in the process of that, of that reorganization, everything is up in the air. Um, and, and very few, far fewer classes are being taught. They're trying to relaunch programs, much consolidation. We, we had six different remote locations they're trying to consolidate online in one central location. So there, there was never the kind of ease of contact because they weren't present on the campus. Um, when I was doing TA organizing, I wouldn't say we succeeded in this, but it was always our goal to have a representative from every department who was regularly text, you know, keeping touch. And that was because we did not have representation rights at either institution for most of the time that I was organizing. Um, we won a six year court battle at University of Michigan. And so for my last two months, our contract was in place from six years before. But, you know, so we had to figure out how we were gonna maintain regular ongoing contact. And that's the only solution ultimately, I think, to these things, I'm starting point anyway, it doesn't. And trying to expand tenure. I mean, uh, Naomi just shared the link um, to the New Deal. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think a bunch of us have been reading about that in the past few months, perhaps excited about the possibilities there. But, you know, for me, as, as someone, I've been on the tenure track for a decade, or, um, and I was an adjunct before that. And at first, I thought, well, you know, like so many others, um, that we should not give tenure to uh, current people who are currently considered contingent faculty. But now it seems to me it's, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, I mean, it's, a, it's an existential issue at this point. We have to have academic freedom for everyone. We have to have job security for everyone who is teaching students, period. And so, you know, if it means forming tenure lines that are not research based 
and are just in teaching. Maybe that's the way we go about it, but we, ha we have to not be um, allowing ourselves to be divided because it's allowing ourselves to be conquered. In Moncton, uh, one of the main challenges is that uh, most of the adjuncts are uh, full-time workers outside the university. So they don't have the time and um, it's realistic as well. They don't have the time to uh, engage or participate as much in the, in the faculty association. So when you have meetings of adjuncts, uh, it's sometimes difficult. It, it opens, uh, often occurs that we need to cancel because there is uh, not enough people attending. But initially in the early uh, 2000, when we uh, started forming the, uh, the, uh, the, the adjunct association, we worked uh, clandestinely in a way. We uh, worked uh, with people outside campus or knocking on doors when no one was uh, in the halls or whatever. Uh, but uh, they understood then, those who were working at the university uh, uh, after the strike, understood the, the importance of joining and, and we had no difficulty uh, of uh, gathering support or enthusiasm for that. But uh, after the association, association was formed and enlarged, it became difficult because of the fact that uh, most of them worked outside. And it still is to this day. Uh, and it's not a creation of the, uh, uh, of the pandemic. It's really something that we struggle on a daily basis uh, uh, before and, and, and then so. Yeah, um, it reminds me, John, I wanted to ask um, this replacing of part-time or adjunct faculty with full-time faculty in your day program, is, is it are um, adjuncts who are interested in full-time positions being encouraged to apply? Are they giving special consideration for these full-time positions? And it's one of the things that the Scholars for New Deal um, are really pushing for. The we divided the search committee into two halves. And I'm on the tender track committee and other people are on the non-tender track committee because with this many positions, I mean, as it is, I read 150 applications and that's because we divided them in half among the tender track committee. So I don't know fully what happened on the NTT side. I have talked to the chair of that committee. Is she the chair? I've talked to a member of that committee uh, who, is not entirely happy with how it was um, organized. So on the one hand, they were, el they were invited to apply, but the job descriptions weren't written with their credentials in mind. Of the finalists, one of the finalists is a, an existing adjunct teaching in that program. I believe that only three of the existing adjunct pool um, actually had the specified requirements of a terminal degree. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but I don't think I am. Um, and did the other two not apply because they saw this as not being a welcoming system or did they apply and not make the finalist pool? I don't know the answer to that. I did suggest to this member of the committee that I would have preferred to form a committee to go visit classes, do an in-depth evaluation of every person currently teaching those courses, which hasn't really happened because there's been like 18, 20 adjuncts doing them and that overwhelms your ability for in-depth. And then offer full-time positions to the ones who your committee judged to be excellent and then hire full-time people to supplement them if there were remaining positions. And she agreed that that's the way she would have wanted to do it, but it's not the way the job description was written up, um, which this was an initiative. English had been asking for converting these to full-time for a while. And then with no real dialogue, the provost came through in February and said, we're going to do this now. But there wasn't really a dialogue about how we're going to do it. It was, we're gonna start in the fall with these full-time people as part of our improved freshman retention strategy. And so a lot of the discussion that could have advocated for more equity did not happen. Um, 
and I know there's some bitterness. I've talked to a couple of the existing adjuncts. I expect that some of them will hang on at least for another year because I don't think we're going to succeed in filling all these positions, frankly. Um, I mean, we've already had several people drop out. of. The, we're interviewing now. We're interviewing next week. Um, it's very late. And, you know, that's not the way to get justice, though, is to have such a, you know, last minute haphazard process that some people default by default have to be kept on. Yeah, it's one of the things that I appreciate about the relationship that our union, our faculty union has with faculty senate. Um, you know, we, we communicate very closely with each other and we have used that to kind of hit the administration from two different sides, as it were, you know, when they announce these things. And we've actually got the administration to roll back <laughs> a lot of things because, uh, because of this um, coalition. And so to be able to, to, to tackle faculty governance from multiple sides, I think is really important. And unionization and, um, and active, I think what Nelson was pointing to, right, that issue with spending all this money on legal fees, that's a sign of business unionism and servicing your members, you know, allegedly, instead of um, educating from within and, and, and you know, building this culture of activism. And I, I think that it, it takes time and it's really hard with faculty unions, but it's something that we have to do on our campuses. We have, we have to start engaging our members, educating our members and pushing really hard to get them involved and to understand like, you know, forcing, pe forcing people to volunteer, <laughs> right? <laughs> to run for these positions is, is not the way to um, protect uh, the workplaces and the learning environments on college campuses. And on this deal, we have a process in place where the executive council, the faculty and the education policy council are supposed to be consulted on new faculty lines. And it was short circuited. That did not happen. The administration just announced it, which increasingly they do. And they say it's because of, you know, pandemic and this and that and the other thing. But when I was faculty chair up until August, I can tell you, for example, they appointed new associate deans. They just appointed them. Um, they must have job descriptions, but the faculty executive council asked for two years. We can't get a hand, our hands on them. There must have been some process through which they chose them. If only the provost had a dream, but um, we can't get them to explain the process. Um, there must be some process to which they're evaluated. Um, if only the whim of the provost. Um, and if we could get you know, so there's been a real decline on that level. And the faculty, you hear enough about financial crisis on the one hand, um, you get worn down bit by bit. So they never come and say, we're gonna just shut down all faculty governance. They whittle at this and they whittle at that. And the same thing with our retirement benefits, they whittle here, they whittle there, but they leave some. And there's a significant level of demobilization which of course the pandemic did not help. It allows for um, that whole divide and conquer strategy. Uh, I mean, we, you know, we, we passed a resolution on the Senate at the beginning of this year, which um, seems like a no brainer, uh, basically. It said that, you know, if you're gonna, um, if you're gonna hire a new uh, division head or a dean, uh, the chair of the search committee should be a tenured faculty member in that division or in that college. And, um, <laughs> and then like the very next search at that level that occurred, which was like two months later or three months later, the provost uh, had another dean from a different college uh, uh, leading that search. And I, I confronted her at the, at the Senate meeting and the president was in the room as well, the new president. And, uh, uh, and I said, you know, we have this resolution. <laughs> no, it should be a no brainer. Uh, well, no, we had a discussion at cabinet was the answer. And we all at cabinet decided that it, we need a Dean to chair this search. <laughs> at least there was a search though, not just some direct imposition from above. Um, I know that we're out of time, but I wanted to want thank you all for um, for this. This has been very helpful. I 
I'm a PhD student at the University of South Carolina. And uh, within the past year, we have unionized. And uh, we're having a lot of trouble getting staff to join as well as faculty. Uh, we do have a good amount of history, or I'm sorry, we actually have a low amount for history PhD students, but we have a higher amount uh, from English and uh, geography. But um, someone coming from, I'm from Illinois, so I am very much, I, I was in the union at the University of Illinois Springfield. Um, so I understand and, and, and studying this, the, you know, the reasons why this is so important, but for people that were raised um, or are used to the South, it's a little bit harder. So I wanted to know, since you guys have had a lot of successes, if, if there were any um, advice on being able to actually recruit more um, faculty, adjunct staff in general um, to the union. And Stephanie, that's a, that's a great question. Um, Cindy left the uh, panel, but um, she might be a great resource for you and the organizing that they're doing in Georgia um, with CWA and and, the, and what they're doing because you know it, it's going to involve a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations, and you know you have to dispel a lot of myths about you know um, unions in the South. Um, and but I think South Carolina actually has a pretty strong state federation. So I don't know if y'all are in contact with the um, AFL-CIO State Federation in South Carolina, that, that might be a great resource to kind of um, help with organizing tools um, to, to, to have these conversations. Because, you know, for us, right, we're starting at a different point. And so we have to meet people where they are. Um, but I think there's a lot of organizing happening in the South. And, uh, there, you know, there, there have been a lot of wins. You know, in Georgia, with the fifteen dollar wage on ca campuses, University of Georgia, I think is is a good thing to point to as you know, hey, look what happens when we come together, even in these places where it's hard. And I think when, where it's hard is actually easy because you know the employers and the state, right, and the politicians just you make it so that you have to work together to make things happen. I know at Illinois Urbana-Champaign, when I was working editing the newsletter and sort of chairing our steering committee, there were eight or 10 of us who were really the union to speak of when I left. But within two years of my leaving, and it's because I left, of course, um, it was, they had won a representation election. And I really think that what happened is we kept pressing issues. We would go out, blanket the um, campus with material about what we were doing, even though there were only a handful of us. And then, so we created this con conception that people were trying to work around these issues. And then at a certain point, after I left the administration overstepped, overplayed its hand, and there was this concept of collective action and people leapt on it and moved. So I think even if you're small, one needs to think about what could we work around? What could we agitate around? Um, and sometimes you can even win things with that because it's not that administrators are open to reason, but they sometimes want to appear to be open to reason. Um, we are, the administrators are refused to meet with us and they refuse um, to acknowledge that we exist. Um, and it is through the United Campus Workers. So we are working um, that, uh, you know, trying to work with other um, organizations within it. But yeah, it's, it's been really difficult for, I mean, the administration just won't even meet with us. And um, even when we won our health, uh, getting health insurance paid for the university for graduate students, um, they kind of, and I'm, we're not surprised by this, but it refused to acknowledge that the union had any part in making that happen. Uh, despite all of the work that we actually did for it. Um, and I don't know if anyone knows, but like there's been a whole issue with our president uh, in the last couple of years of how he was hired, then he just quit and now we're gonna have to have another person. Um, and so there's a lot of turn around. And so we are hoping that, you know, maybe the new president will actually be more um, welcoming for unions, but it's, it's definitely a known uphill battle in particular for this, for our union um, 
especially because we are having trouble people of getting people to even sign up to like do the work uh, or attend our general meetings. Um, and so, yes, um, uh, thank you for the advice. And if um, this has been very enlightening of just how different uh, successes that you guys have had. Um, and I'm going to make sure to um, bring that uh, this information back to the union as well during our next meeting. I don't know if we have still time, but I'd like to know more about your own experiences with the, the CASA representation uh, beyond what Naomi was talking about, the, the culture, developing the culture within the, uh, the association. How do you deal and have you had to deal with uh, issues such as those that I briefly presented? Uh, is what I presented unique? Uh, uh, I'd just like to know more about uh, what you experience on your own uh, university setting? No, uh, <clears throat> that's unfortunately been my, ex my experience, Nelson. It wasn't my topic, um, but um, uh, there's uh, sometimes a lot of craziness from the current union leadership where I am in terms of like emails sent to the entire faculty uh, about how you, how you're going to get vaccinated and then you're going to get sick and die. Um, I mean, just ridiculous things that have no basis in, in, in research. And, um, uh, you know, there were some people who thought that I could solve it and they nominated me to be president of the union. And I, yeah, I've been on bargaining teams in the past few years, but I've never been an officer of the union. And it was basically like, let's get Gollum in here to clean house. And that's not on my agenda. And I, cause I'm currently feeling burned out on leadership. Uh, and we ended up getting, you know, another person ran unopposed and um, we just hope that they can, you know, keep the, keep some sort of a veneer of, of competence uh, going forward. Um, and they, they, you know, we all tend to come together every three years to negotiate good contracts. That's, that's been very helpful, but in between the contracts, we have a leadership that kind of <laughs> fights the wrong fights, picks fights that don't need to be picked and leaves others, you know, hanging. And I, you know, I wish it was, I wish it was otherwise, but I, I can't always be the one, you know, to, to, to fix it. Don't let that be the final note of the con of the of the panel, though. <laughs> well, so you know, I mean. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, you know, Dave, it's not going to be much better. You know, when I was at SUNY Brockport, the University of New York, you know, the United University profession Professions, our union there, I felt like that was a key problem, and it depended on individual campuses and the culture on the campus. Um, how involved people were, but you know, I want to go back further to my experiences in my, in my graduate student union. Um, at the TAA at UW Madison, we work really hard in leadership positions to, um, you know, especially too because we have turnover, right, in graduate student unions. We work really hard to educate um, our stewards, our you know, our shop stewards and um, our activists to to understand how things happen and how things work. You know, I, you know, I was treasurer. You know, I had an accounting background, and as we lost um, dues checkoff, right? You know, I spent a lot of time training other graduate students on how to read these financial reports, how to understand, how to how to do a budget, how to file the paperwork, and. It, but again, right, it you know, same thing that you were saying and, and what Stephanie's alluding to, you have to have the volunteers there and you have to do the work to kind of get the volunteers to show up and then to, to take on some of those tasks, right? Because looking at it as a, you know, oh, you know, this is a problem, let me find a specialist to deal with it as opposed to working together and understanding how it works. You know, a lot of what we did in, our, in the TAA was um, educating ourselves and, you know, just meeting, over drinks and kind of 
trying to go through all of this stuff to try to find solutions for ourselves, try to find answers for ourselves so that we could take things to the administration. Um, but it was a culture that we created over several years and several actually generations of um, union leadership. So it just takes a lot of internal organizing um, work, I think, to, to kind of solve these issues and to bring it up, you know, every time I try to have a budget meeting at my unions, you know, everybody's eyes just glaze over and they just kind of stop paying attention. It's hard to get people, right? You know, Nelson, you're like, you know, well, this expenditure is too high. We need to get it down, right? <laughs> How do we get people to do that? <laughs> it's, you know, it's a lot. So we are running over, but I see that Elliot has turned on her computer, or her screen. Maybe she wants to get in a, a comment or a question. I'm happy to hopefully bring a positive note. Uh, I am coming at this from a different angle. I'm a recently uh, completed student at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies and have interned this past semester with our professional staff Congress and I'm potentially going on to work for them as union staff. So. Just wanted to say I appreciate hearing from all of you. I don't know if I will ever see it from your side specifically, but uh, just hearing about all your experiences has been helpful because I'm just trying to listen to you know every level of the stratified uh, faculty and staff that I'm you know working on behalf of to figure out where the strategies are. So thank you all so much for this panel. It was great. That's a great organization. I'm looking forward to Barbara Bowen's speech in a couple of weeks. Unfortunately, it won't be in person, but I guess fortunately, because I'm not in New York. So. <laughs> well, thanks everyone. Um, I guess as the panel organizer, I'll ba bang the proverbial gavel on this and um, you know, hope to see you at the, some of the remaining panels in this very, very long um, uh, law check conference. Uh, any final words from anyone or? <laughs> Otherwise, thank you, everybody. Thanks again, Dave. Thank you. Thank you to all. And thanks for thanks for coming. And thank you. Thank you. Yeah.